Hello, this is David Yowd with more 8-bit Commodore Easter eggs for you. In previous videos, I showed the Microsoft Easter egg that is hidden in some of the early Commodore PET models, as well as the anti-nuke uh, political Easter egg in the Commodore 128. This time I'm going to show six different Easter eggs, uh, some of them in Commodore computers, others hidden inside uh, Commodore disk drives. A few of them are pretty tiny and not as flashy as some that you've seen, but I still think they're worth uh, unearthing. So I'm going to be jumping around platforms quite a bit, and we'll be starting here with the Commodore Plus 4. Now, if you haven't seen one of these before, this was an 8-bit computer released in 1984. It came with a built-in word processor, spreadsheet, uh, a drawing program, file manager, and these were all just built into the system's ROM, ready to go right off the bat when you turned it on. The computer was a commercial flop, doesn't get nearly as much love as the Commodore 64 from the retro computing crowd, but it does have its diehard fans. So I recently read the book Freaks, The Brief History of the Computer Demo Scene, written in 2008, which I'll provide a link to below. It includes a long interview with Hackaday um, superstar, basically, former Commodore engineer Bill Hurd, in which Hurd asks the interviewer if he knows about the Plus 4 Easter egg. And when reading this, I didn't know about the Plus 4 Easter egg, so I looked it up. And if you want to see it, you type in SYS 52651. There it is. So I had to look up um, most of these names. Fred uh, Bowen was one of the main developers of Commodore Kernels. Uh, John Cooper did some I.O. work, including cassette handling. Terry Ryan was involved in the later versions of the Commodore Basic. Uh, and Bill Hurd, of course, was the principal engineer. If I'm underrepresenting or worse misrepresenting their contributions, then just please tell me in the comments. Anyway, you're probably staring at this blinking, flashing text that kind of reminds me of how popular that annoying and overused HTML blinking tag was in the Netscape Navigator back in the late 90s. This flashing you see, it doesn't require any continuous changes to the values in the screen RAM or the color RAM. Uh, instead, it's handled by the Plus 4's uh, TED chip. The TED chip uh, provides the blinking, as well as all the video processing, sound, keyboard input handling, memory refresh, a bunch of stuff. A Commodore company was making their own chips so they could pack all kinds of features into them. On the Commodore 64, the color memory was only four bits wide, but on not so on the plus four. It, it's using the seventh bit here to tell the TED that it wants the text to flash on those locations. So. And you can turn it uh, on by printing the Petsky character 130 or using the flash on button on the keyboard, which is on the less than sign. There's a flash off button as well. Um, anyway, it doesn't take much time to describe how this Easter egg works since it's not all that well hidden, at least compared to the more well-known pet Microsoft Easter egg or the Commodore 128 anti-nuke Easter egg, uh, both of which I think were designed to escape Commodore management's notice. The code has no obfuscation and has very little data obfuscation. The PET and the 128 had both of their eggs hidden in the basic ROMs, but this one's in the kernel ROM. So we're going to take a look at it. The, the Plus 4 has a machine language monitor built into it. This wasn't true of the Commodore 64 or the VIC-20. Uh, the PET had a machine language monitor on all but the earliest systems, uh, which you could start up by just executing a break instruction. Uh, it was named Tim for TinyMon, but the Plus 4 monitor is named uh, TedMon. So anyway, since the plus four runs basic version 3.5, there's a command that we can use to get the hex value of this. Uh, we would just uh, say print hex, um, let's see, what was that? 52651. And that's gonna be our starting address, which I already knew, but I just thought that command was kind of cool. So let's take a look at the code. Type in monitor. Oh, I spelled it wrong, monitor. Mon it or okay and we're gonna take a look at that code okay it's only seven lines of assembly so it's pretty short so this first line here uh it's just going to put the number 33 into the y register we're going to read 34 characters so this is the starting uh, value for the decrementing loop uh, the next line is going to load a character from the ciphertext uh, area base address um, plus the Y value. So the first time it goes through the loop, it adds 33 to it. And the next time it adds 32 all the way down to zero. That does imply that the string is indeed stored backwards in the ROM, which people tend to do a lot. 
Uh, the next one is how the obfuscation works. Uh, this is an XOR mask. It applies to each character. Uh, hex 55 is going to flip every other uh, bit. And then we have a jump to FFD2. Uh, so across the Commodore 8-bit machines, there's a standardized jump table of kernel routines uh, that live at the end of the addressable memory. Uh, and if you make a jump uh, call to FFD2, it's going to print the pesky, uh, sorry, Petsky uh, value that's held in the accumulator, which prints at the current cursor position and advances the cursor. This is the same right here entry point um, for the VIC-20, the Commodore 64, the 128, others. Uh, even though there's great variations in their kernels, this remains the same. So this kernel routine was originally called CHR out on the plus four, it's called a BS out. Uh, the next one, this line, decrements the X register, it subtracts one from it, which can affect zero and negative flags accordingly. After the subtraction on this line, if you get an underflow, if you go below zero, the negative flag will be set. If that flag was not set, then the loop is going to continue by going back up to uh, this line again, which loads the next character from ROM. And when it's all done, uh, we return and finish. So it's pretty simple. Um, X to exit. So I always like to write um, some basic, which does the same thing. And let's take a look at that. So this is basic that I thought would print out the text. Um, unlike the Commodore 128, the uh, plus four doesn't have an XOR, so this little line right there uh, does that. So let's run this. And we get a bunch of U's. That is not our Easter egg. So why did that happen? Well, if we print peak, and let's see, 52617. Um, that should be the last character in the ciphertext. Uh, we get a zero. And we do it for the next to the last character in the ciphertext. We get a zero. And the next to the next last one, we get a zero. All of these, we're getting zeros. And the reason why is because when we're looking at that address range, uh, by default, the monitor program sees the ROM data. It sees the code. It sees the ciphertext or the obfuscated text. But in basic programs, you see the RAM that is sitting under the ROM. Now, that's because on the Commodore Plus 4, it banks out. Sorry, that was me doing air quotes. You can't see. It, it banks out uh, the ROM. And they do this so that there's more accessible RAM for programmers. Now, this is normally a great feature, but it's getting in our way here. So... I knew the bank switching was an issue, but I couldn't figure out how to get around it. Unfortunately, I asked the experts over at the Commodore uh, Plus 4 world, and they showed me what to do. I'll put a link to Plus 4 world in the video description uh, below when I'm done talking. But here's how you fix it. So I'm just going to add uh, two more lines. Uh, poke 1177, comma 62, and poke 1177, comma 63. And with these two in place, now the basic program can access the ROM values. The next Easter egg I'm going to show is hidden in the ROM of the 1571 uh, floppy disk drive. Now, people that use Commodore drives know that even the simplest DOS commands on early models weren't exactly easy to use or terse in any way. And revealing this Easter egg will be no exception. By comparison, on a modern operating system such as Linux, you know, if you wanted to rename a file, you just type like move old file name to new file name, and that's going to do the renaming for you. Uh, but on these old drives, uh, to rename a file, you'd probably have to type, at least on Commodore 64, open 15, comma 8, comma 15, uh, colon print, which sends a command, uh, number 15, rename zero colon new file name uh, equals old file name and then close oops close uh, 15 so that's a lot of typing uh, it certainly required a, a certain level of uh, tech savvy on the part of the user so the secret text in um, the 1571 Apparently, it didn't come with any way to really invoke it. You just had to read it directly out of the disk drive's uh, ROM. 
uh, using these kinds of commands. So let's take a look at how it works. The little program I have here. Okay, so this is the program that's going to display the engineer's names for the software and the hardware. Let's run that. There we go. And since we did no modifications to the data when we get out of the memory, you can tell that it's stored in, in plain text in the ROM. So how this works in review, uh, open 1, 8, 15. Uh, this first parameter is just the file number uh, or the logical address. It's a number of programmer assigns to the file that's being opened. Every simultaneously open file needs its own number. So it's from 1 to 254. Uh, the second parameter is the device number, which you're all probably used to disk drives uh, being device number eight, but there's a number of different devices for different things. And this third parameter, uh, number 15 here, that's the one you generally see. That's when you're um, uh, invoking commands. Uh, two through four are for passing data to and through a device. One and zero is reserved, but the 15 is when you're sending commands. Uh, and this command that we're sending is this M-R that stands for memory read. The 2 and the 128 are the low and high bytes of memory location 32770. Uh, if that's not obvious or you're not used to low and high bytes, uh, any address is split up into two bytes uh, where one is times 256 and the other is added to it. Uh, for instance, in this case, if that's our address, we can say the high is equal to int. Whoops. Um, divided by 256. So there's the high byte, low equal to L minus I times 256. And there's a low byte. So you see the 2 and the 128. Okay, uh, this next uh, byte that we pass in um, is how many uh, characters we want to read, and n was set to 45. So we're going to read 45 characters. Then this get number right here just uh, reads a byte of information, and we just fetch them all and print it back out to the screen. This next Easter egg is also in a Commodore drive, this time the 1581, which took three and a half inch uh, floppy disks. And this drive Easter egg is more sophisticated than the last one I showed uh, because this one is hidden in two error messages that the drive can be made to return. And so since we're talking about error messages, I want to just give an example of what a good old drive error message looks like. There. We open a communication channel um, here. And so with print, we can send uh, commands um, to that channel. And what we're going to send is uh, the command blah. And blah is not a command, so we don't expect that to do much. Press run. Sure enough, we get a syntax error. And the return string shows um, the error number, uh, the error message, and then the track and sector, which are, of course, of course both uh, zero because we didn't even access the disk for this error. Now, for the longest time, I didn't know that the disk error numbers were actually hex decimal numbers since the drive designers saw fit to implement implement uh, 35 different error numbers, each of which avoided choices that would have used the letters A through F in their representation. So this error number 31 right here for syntax error is actually really error number 49 in base 10. Um, now in basic, um, I also didn't use this in the last example, it's this variable ST. You didn't see us declare it, that's because it's a reserved variable. Uh, it's called status. Uh, it's this read-only variable that shows I.O. status uh, condition. So it's going to be zero as we're fetching characters from the drive. But when there's no more characters left, that six bit in the, um, that's the value of ST is going to turn on, which indicates the end of the file, giving it a non-zero value, and then we stop um, looping back to line 30. So anyway, now that we've seen errors, let's look at the Easter egg errors. So I'm going to say, let's see, load this program. Okay, so let's just run this. There 
there we go. There's our Easter egg from two different errors. So there are an additional two undocumented uh, commands that throw uh, these errors. One is this B minus question mark, which throws error number 79. And then the command uh, B minus star, which throws error 7A. Now this is the only error number I know of that includes a non-base 10 uh, digit in it. The A, though, when returned here, looks like a colon. And that's because while A normally comes after 9 in hex, colon comes after 9 in Petsky ordering. And I guess they didn't decode uh, their hex values. So again, the Easter egg messages are stored in the drive as plain text, so there's really no need to show any disassemblies or a deobfuscation code, because there isn't any. Uh, if you get a hold of this drive's ROM and open up in a hex editor, you're just going to see the message there. But just for fun, we can also generate these Easter egg errors by writing a small assembly language program that will run inside the RAM of the 1581. Most, if not all, of the Commodore drives were programmable computers in their own right, and the 1581 had a 6502 processor in it, it had 8K of RAM, so we can put code in there and run it. Uh, so let's show how that's done with a memory write command. So this is a simple program that doesn't do uh, very much. What it's going to do is inject a single RTS, or return instruction, into RAM of the drive, and it's going to execute it. So up here we have a memory write uh, that's going to write to the drive's memory. Uh, this 06 uh, is in little Indian format, remember the small byte goes in first, so this is 600 uh, in hex. And the Commodore drives have a small number of 256 byte buffers. This one is specifying buffer number 3, which starts at hex 600. Uh, this next character is just telling it we're going to be writing one byte and here's the one byte it's this 96 which is the um for the rts return from subroutine instruction uh in assembly in machine code sorry that's has the value of 96. next line we're going to do a memory execute now that that code is in the drive's memory and again we're going to execute at that same address that we put the instructions in uh, hex 600. okay so let's run this there, it did nothing. Um, so nothing's kind of boring. So let's use this technique to inject code into the 1581 that it can invoke uh, the two error conditions. So I have code for that. Okay, and let's just run it. And boom, there's the two errors we saw done in an entirely different way. Um, let me go up here. So here's a memory write. And it's, this is a little bit harder to read, but basically this D1 string, I'm um, this time I'm putting it into uh, RAM buffer 0 instead, which starts at hex 300. 5 is the number of bytes to follow. Sorry, 5 is right there. And then this first instruction, 169, that's going to be a load the accumulator. And that accumulator is going to get loaded twice with two runs through here. One time it's going to be loaded with 121 and one time with 122. Now the 121 is the error number hex 79. And the 122 is the error uh, hex 7a that we saw earlier. Um, and then the next assembly is going to be a jump instruction. And it's going to jump to... The 63255 are the low and high bytes of the command error routine in the drive itself that, that invokes an error. Uh, that's 65343. So triggering that error transfers the error message into the error buffer, which we then read out. If we'd changed this to, say, right here, a 49, that's hex 31, which we saw earlier was the syntax error, and syntax error would pop out instead. So basically, we can trigger any error we want by hex error number uh, using this code. So in addition to the more famous Commodore 128 Easter egg, there's a stretch of unobfuscated text in the ROM uh, starting at memory location 25589. This is in the part of the basic ROM that supports drawing rectangles. And there's really no way to invoke it that I know of. You just have to read it out of memory. So I have a program here to do that. I'm going to type in run. There they are. We saw Fred Bowen and uh, Terry Ryan referenced earlier in this video.
but I couldn't find any information on this Mike I fellow. So if any of you know, please leave some comments. Now that same hidden text we just showed on the Commodore 128 is also in the plus four, but it lives at a different memory location. So I have a program here that will display it. As you can see, it's the same three names. Uh, the difference, of course, is that remember from earlier, we had to use that poke command, uh, 1177, to make the ROM data viewable from basic. So we're just doing that here again. And lastly, this Commodore 64 Easter egg is so tiny, you might not have known you were looking at one, but I thought I'd include it anyway. We press run here, and we get back RRBY, just four characters. These are stored near the very end of memory in the Commodore 64 kernel. Uh, these are the initials of Robert Russell, and an important Commodore engineer, and Robert uh, Yans, the man who designed the, of course, famous Commodore SID chip. And that's all I got for this time. If you know of other 8-bit Commodore Easter eggs that I missed, please reply in the comments. Uh, also, just to make sure I get a few down thumbs on this video, I have an annoying music sign-off, so close this window in case you don't want to hear it. This is an old joke. I've never seen it set to music before. Uh, so until next time, I leave you with this.